All right, folks, welcome to another episode of Coffee with Kevin. Diesel heaters, they are all the hype, but are they worth the effort? In this video, we're gonna dig into that and let you know. Now sitting beside me here is the Viver 8KW unit. We've been using this unit right here for over a year now, and it's time to dig in and tell you our thoughts. And while it's certainly been a game changer, it's had its fair share of issues. So let's dive in and let you know what we think. But first, roll that intro. Now, if you're new here, I'm Kevin with Lifestyle Overland, and this channel is usually all about myself and my family traveling all over North America and sharing our adventures. But today, we're in the garage sharing you some thoughts on gear that we've been using for a while now. And by the way, we're a viewer-supported channel, so none of this stuff you see here was sponsored. Now, let's kick things off with a little bit of background on this unit. This design operates off of a heat exchanger process, so your heated air and your combustion are in two separate chambers. Unlike things like the Buddy Heater that we've been using for several years where the propane is actually burnt and all the heat is transferred in one single process, which leaves a little bit of room for unburnt fuel and carbon monoxide. So this thing is just a touch safer. Now, this is nothing new. This design has been around since the 1960s. And if you owned an air-cooled Volkswagen back in those days and lived in a cool climate, you might have had something like this up in the trunk or frunk now, I guess that's what we're calling them. But one of these heaters would sit up there, tap straight into your fuel supply and be able to click that thing on and heat up a Volkswagen because those old Volkswagens, they did not have great heating systems. Flash forward to now, rumor has it that the patent has expired on that particular design. Now, I don't know how true that is, but China has never really had a problem copying stuff that's already patented anyhow. Either way, these units come in at about 10% of the cost of the name brands, but there's a catch as there always is with something like that. There are a lot of hurdles to overcome to make this thing operate reliably. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about that, but first, let's dive into this with some good news. The good news is this thing puts out an incredible amount of consistent heat when it's working right. And it's gonna give you about 12 to 15 hours of runtime on a single tank of fuel. The power requirements for the fan are not that bad. The label here says 40 watts, but it's usually less than that because the speed's gonna vary depending upon how much heat that you wanna pump into your tent or vehicle. Now there's different kits to pick from. This one right here is an all-in-one inclusive unit. It's all packed into a nice little steel enclosure here that's portable, but you can also buy the bits and pieces if you wanna install that into your vehicle or trailer or anything like that. Now, one of my favorite parts about this unit, and I didn't even know it came with it until I got it and opened up the box, but it's actually got a remote. And surprisingly, this thing works well from a pretty good distance away. So that means that you don't have to climb out of your tent if you wanna adjust the temperature. You just press the plus or press the minus, go up or down. If you get too hot, you can actually turn it completely off and then turn it right back on again. So this was a nice surprise and it seems to be working really well so far. You do have several options when it comes to heating your trailer or tent or vehicle. There's also a propane option and that's made by Propex. But the feedback that I've gotten from some friends say that it's a little bit irritating because it'll actually kick on, heat up to the right temperature and then shut completely off. So sometimes it can be a little disturbing to your sleep. I know, first world problems, right? Now, if you'd rather have a thermostatically controlled output, you can do that with this unit. You can switch it to a thermostat control, but you're gonna to have to extend the wiring harness from this controller and relocate it up into your tent. Might be worth the effort, but so far we've enjoyed a steady, consistent output and having this remote next to you, when you start getting a little too cold, you just roll over, hit it a few times, and the thing will spool up and get you nice and toasty real quick. And then another little hack that we kind of came up with inadvertently was when we bought this, I think it's a 25 foot section of dryer hose, we had a little bit of excess. We didn't need all that length, but because it was so cold, our fear was that our drinking water that sits in the bumpers of our vehicles would freeze up. And so took the excess, laid it over the tank, wrapped it in a blanket. You can use Mylar as well and it kept that water nice and toasty all night long, as well as us up in the tent. So win-win. Though I will say, if you're gonna put Mylar around your water tank, make sure the wind's not gonna be whipping because it will drive you crazy. Now, there are some downsides to this, and as you can imagine, at 10%, the cost of something that was originally designed and built in Germany with German engineering, we got some difficulties to overcome. So let's just run down the list of the things that we've been struggling with. Number one, from the factory, 
there were loose connections inside. We had one night of peaceful sleep that was interrupted because it started throwing a code saying low voltage. Well, I knew that my battery was just fine. And so after we dug into it, I found that the connections from the factory on the inside were loose. And so it was not getting the voltage that it needed. So I highly recommend that you disassemble this unit when you get it in and make sure everything's nice and tight. But we're gonna cover some of the fixes in more detail here in just a second. Another thing to be aware of is this exhaust gets extremely hot. When I was doing a burn-in at my parents' farm there in Tennessee, it actually started to light the grass on fire. And this was green grass. So highly recommend that you put some type of heat tape around that exhaust or have some sort of stand to keep it up off the ground. No matter what you do, just make sure there's no combustible materials nearby that can get up against that and cause a fire. It's also not the greatest enclosure, especially when you're gonna be driving down rough roads and putting a lot of vibrations through this thing. Screws start to rattle loose, things start to fall apart. So just be prepared that you're gonna be tinkering on this thing off and on. And then another first world problem is the fuel pump can get a little annoying. It's tick, 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 tick. Now there are a lot of fixes out there. This one is actually a lot quieter than some that I've heard because the fuel pump actually sits in a rubber gasket. So there are different things that you can do to really quieten those down. But again, like I said, when you disassemble this the first time, just make sure that it's really secure and isolated. And then one of the biggest problems is if you run this at the wrong settings, so if your fuel pump is pushing too much or too little fuel for the altitude that you're camping at, it does not take long to fill that entire heat exchanger chamber with carbon, and we've done it. Now, the good news is that can easily be fixed, but there's some advanced settings that you're gonna have to get into within this controller to make sure that you don't run into the issue. And you're also gonna run into a big issue when you first start it up with just some toxic, noxious fumes as the metal and the plastic and all that burns off a bit. The bad news is it doesn't completely go away, but we've got some ideas to try and work on that. Something else that you have to be mindful of is you're gonna have to carry a different fuel source. This is diesel. So if you're like most Americans anyhow, we have gas or petrol vehicles, and then you're probably gonna be carrying propane for your campfire pit or your gas stove. And then you're also going to bring diesel along as well. So that's a little bit of a hurdle to overcome. Just make sure that you've got a nice secure place to put a diesel tank. The good news is, it doesn't use a heck of a lot of fuel, so it's not like you need to bring five gallons every time. If you're gonna be out for two or three nights, two or three gallons would probably be sufficient for what you need. Another problem that we ran into was after some time, things began to shift inside this enclosure and our fuel lines got up against one of the studs for the exhaust manifold. And after about four hours of runtime one night, just long enough to get comfortable and for it to get really cold outside, this thing shut off and it was because it burnt the fuel line into. Thankfully, it didn't catch on fire, but it was still a little bit of a chilly night trying to get that thing patched back up and put back together. So. Like I said earlier, you're gonna to wanna to disassemble this. Tie wraps are your friend. Just make sure that nothing can shift around and get up against hot manifolds or sharp edges and you'll be a lot better off down the road. One of the frustrating issues with this design is if you accidentally spill some fuel, say you overfill the tank, it runs down inside the enclosure here. So the next time you turn it on, if you don't take it apart and dry out all of that diesel and wipe it down with maybe some rubbing alcohol, you're gonna get a nice fresh blast of raw diesel fuel in your fresh air intake because the fresh air intake is actually inside the unit. It doesn't extend out past the unit. So I think that's kind of a design flaw. We've got some ideas to rework this in the future, but it's something to be mindful of. And on that note, you can also run into an issue if you're bouncing down the trail. This cap is not great about sealing off this tank. So if it splashes up enough onto that cap, it'll begin to seep out the vent, work its way down into the enclosure again. So we highly recommend doing something like this Ziploc to make sure that you're not going to wind up with another blast of diesel fuel whenever you crank it up. All right, so let's move on to the fixes, the things that we did to make this not just an annoyance, but now a central part of our winter adventures. Number one, like I said, you're gonna to wanna to disassemble this thing and make sure everything is where it's supposed to be and then it's not gonna move from that position. And then you're gonna to wanna to run this at your home for at least eight or 10 hours. You wanna run it through a full cycle of fuel, make sure all those fumes are burned off as much as possible 
possible. Make sure that nothing's going to get hot and melt. And then once you've confirmed in a location where you're not needing heat, then you can take it out on your first camping trip. And then one of the biggest tips that we recommend that you dig into is learning the advanced settings on this controller. Nothing's going to stop this thing faster than running it at the wrong pump setting for the wrong altitude. Now those settings are a little bit more involved than what we're going to get into in this video, but if you subscribe, we'll be coming back with a disassembly video and then walk you through some of the advanced settings as well. And one of those settings is actually how to prime the pump. If you run this tank completely out overnight, your fuel lines are going to be nothing but air. So the next night when you go to turn this thing on, chances are it will not restart on the next cycle because there's too much air in those lines. So you're going to need to prime the pump. But I will forewarn you, don't get too carried away with this. If you put too much fuel in there, you can carbon up the chamber yet again, or there's a potential that you could foul out your igniter as well. So be very judicious when you prime that pump. And then I mentioned before, we wrap this thing in a heat tape early on in the cycle. It's made a huge difference. I highly recommend that everyone does that, but I will forewarn you, make sure you wear gloves, some decent gloves when you wrap this thing up because those fiberglass fibers will get all on your fingers. And that's probably another first world problem, but it's annoying. Now this unit comes with pretty much everything you need to get started. You will need a power source. What we've done with ours is I actually have just a 12 volt plug on the end. I've got a couple of different power packs that I use from time to time. I've even got a port on the roof rack of the GX here that I can plug into and that taps me into the aux system. So just make sure that you have something with probably a minimum of 20 amp hours would be sufficient for a night, but I'd highly recommend you get up closer to 50 or even 100 if you can swing it. Because the last thing you want to do is run out of juice to blow that beautiful warm air up into your sleeping space. And then these heat ducts, you can get at Lowe's or Home Depot or pretty much any home supply store. Like I said, 25 feet is way too much than what we actually need, but if you got some water that you want to wrap up, it's good to have that as well. You can always take the excess up into the tent with you because there's a lot of nice radiant heat that comes off the outside of this too. So you can actually wrap that around your feet if you want and then take the vent and stick it back up. Just depends on how cold you expect it to be. So it probably goes without saying, but something of this quality level has a lot of things that need to be done to make sure that it's gonna work for you. Something that you need to be mindful of though, is if you don't have a fire extinguisher yet, please get a fire extinguisher, whether you use this or not. Everyone who's out in the wilderness needs to be carrying a good fire extinguisher that's readily accessible. So if this thing does go sideways on you, you know you can extinguish it. And that brings up another good point because I've seen a few people who camp with this thing sitting on a table attached to their rear tire. <sighs> now the odds are fairly slim that this thing's going to ignite. But again, remember, this wasn't built to the same quality standards as the originals. And there's a possibility that if something goes wrong, you could burn down your entire rig. So a little bit of separation, it's not a bad thing. And I'm not saying that to scare you off or to say that this thing is just going to spontaneously combust, but it's just something to be thinking about. Any of your heat sources, you need to be prepared to extinguish and maybe not put them close to your most valuable possession. That being the vehicle that's going to get you back out of the wilderness. And for those of you who are brave enough to install it in your vehicle, best of luck. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Now, without getting into all the troubleshooting things, there is one thing that you need to be mindful of as you're using this. If you all of a sudden see a huge reduction in the amount of hot air that is coming into your tent or into your sleeping space, chances are you've got some carbon buildup within the heat exchanger. So you wanna definitely make sure that on your next stop, you disassemble it, clean it out, and make sure that everything's okay. That can also be a symptom of fuel. So if you have an excessive amount of air bubbles in your fuel line, that might be part of your problem. But just so you know, we've tried to get all the air bubbles out of the system and the pump actually cavitates and creates a bubble with every cycle. So it can't be completely remedied. Remedied? But the good news is it doesn't seem to really affect it. All right, that seems like an incredibly long list of cons, but once you work through them, once you take care of all the little things and get everything tweaked, get your altitude right, it's a rock solid unit. We've not had any failures 
since our last evolution of working through getting our fuel line fixed, getting the carbon out of it. It's been really, really amazing. It's absolutely changed our game. It's expanded our camping season. And let me tell you, when you have that level of comfort when you're sleeping out in the wilderness, there's just something that brings you back because you know that you're gonna be just roasty toasty all night long. And especially if you have kids or a wife who are on the edge about winter camping and stuff, this right here can potentially change that entire attitude. I know that it really has helped Sarah and Caroline as well. So it's a central part of our kit now. And knock on wood, you know, it's been running smooth since we worked through all the issues. So if we revisit the question, is this diesel heater worth jumping through all the hoops and all the tweaks to get it up and running? I say yes. I say at 10% of the cost of some of the brand names and stuff, it's definitely fit the bill for us. So it's getting our cautious recommendation with a few caveats. At this point, really the only complaint that I have about it is the fact that it continues to emit a funky smell. And I wanna try some different things. We're probably gonna bust this entire enclosure apart and move it to a more substantial carry case where I can separate that air intake for the fresh air that goes up to your sleeping area and hopefully mitigate some of the smells that we're getting. And on that note, if you don't have a CO2 monitor, they're not that expensive. It wouldn't be a bad idea to put it in your sleeping area just in case, because if these fumes, enough of these fumes, get sucked into the intake and, you you know, if the wind's blowing just right, that's always a possibility. You wanna have that extra level, that extra layer of protection to know that you're not starting to poison <laughs> yourself or your family up in the tent. Again, might be over the top, but we're taking a lot of risk on the front end knowing that this is a lower quality unit. So why not back that up with a very simple device to make sure that you're gonna be safe. All right, well, I think that's gonna wrap it up for this video. It's already getting a little bit long. I just wanted to give you our thoughts, let you know if we think that this is worth the investment, both in the money and the time to get it dialed in. Answer is absolutely, it is. Now there's more to talk about. We wanna show you guys how to completely disassemble this, all the way down to the heat exchanger itself, show you how to clean out the carbon and then we're also gonna walk you through the advanced settings in this particular controller here. There's a lot of different ones out there, but if you've bought this unit, by the way, links gonna be down below here. If you've bought this particular unit, you'll be able to follow along step by step. So make sure you're subscribed if you haven't already, hit the notification bell thingamajigger, and we'll see you on the next one. But until then, remember, stay curious and leave it better than you found it. <laughs>